While you are watching this brief video, the Benmore Hydro Power Station will have produced enough electricity to run this light bulb for around 2 million hours. The abundance of environmentally friendly hydroelectric power in New Zealand is the envy of most nations. Around 80% of the country's power is produced by this economical and infinitely renewable method. One third of the country's electricity, 1,740 megawatts, is produced by a series of eight hydro power stations in the Waitaki Valley. Benmore is the largest of these. When built, it was the biggest construction project ever undertaken in the country. It produces 540 megawatts, enough to power a city the size of Auckland. However, the first dam to hold the flow of the Waitaki River is just above Kurao, some 75 kilometers from the river's mouth into the Pacific Ocean. Built between 1928 and 1934, it involved excavating some 564,000 cubic metres of material, almost all of it by pick and shovel. The next station to be built was the small Tekapo A at the head of the Tekapo River, and the most distant from the Pacific. In the 1970s and 80s, a further four stations were built as part of the Upper Waitaki Power Scheme. Five stations are linked by 60 kilometres of man-made canals, a major project involving the excavation of 45 million cubic metres of spoil. The water, which has already generated some 873 megawatts of power, now flows into Lake Benmore. Lake Benmore was created when the Benmore Dam was completed in 1964. It covers an area of 79 square kilometres falls to a depth of 110 metres at its deepest point and holds one and a half times more water than the Wellington Harbour. When the Benmore Dam was originally designed, it was for two generators to supply the South Island. However, the final plan incorporated six 90 megawatt generators so the station could supply electricity to the North Island as well. Work began in 1958. The centre core is made up of clay and gravel, compacted so it has close to the strength of concrete. Supporting this and stopping any possible erosion are two massive shoulders of river gravel with an outer layer of rocks, riprap, as protection against weather and wave action. Much of the material to build the dam came from what is now known as Loch Laird. As a spin-off from hydro development, this is now a very popular area for swimming and boating activities. Building the dam was a truly international effort. Men and equipment came from North America, the continent, the South Pacific and of course New Zealand. At its peak, over 1,200 men were employed on the project, putting in place some 28 million tonnes of material. The base of the dam is nearly half a kilometre wide. It rises 110 metres to a crest of 11 metres, along which runs a road almost a kilometre in length. Before the dam could be started, a diversion channel had to be built to keep the river away from the construction site. This took two years to complete. The dam itself was a further five years in construction, a total of seven years. It was officially opened in 1965 when power flowed from Benmore's first generator. The other five followed within 12 months. The final result was the largest dam of any type in the country. It is a tribute to both the designers and the construction teams that the project was completed ahead of schedule and under budget. The total cost, in 1965 dollars, was $66 million. While work was progressing at Benmore, a start was made on the construction of the Aviemore Dam 19 kilometres downstream. This 220 megawatt station came on stream three years after Benmore, and many staff worked on both projects. Now let's have a look at how electricity is produced at Benmore. Water rushes down these huge pipes called penstocks. Weighing in at 3,127 tonnes each, they are among the largest in the world. Each penstock is made up of 53 sections like this. They are 45 centimetres thick and 5.3 metres in diameter. Placed together, they extend upwards 175 metres. There is no truth in the rumour that staff arriving late are forced to run up all these steps alongside each penstock. Great way to keep fit, though. Now, try and imagine over 80 million bottles of milk. Mind-boggling, huh? Yet that's the amount of water that flows down these penstocks every minute. 
It comes rushing into this snail-like scroll case at 114,000 litres per second, around 22 kilometres an hour. It then flows out of the dam through this draft tube and into Lake Aviemore. So just how did the water make electricity? Well, to tell the truth, it didn't. In fact, water does not make electricity. What water does do is turn turbines like this. Let's have a look at this model. By operating this hydraulic ram, these wicket gates can be opened and closed. When opened, the gates direct the water against these turbine blades. This forces them to start turning, and after about half a minute, the turbine reaches its operating speed of exactly 166.7 revs per minute. The turbine is connected to a generator by means of this massive steel shaft. It is the generator which produces the electricity. The water, having done its job of turning the turbine, empties into Lake Aviemore just as clean and fresh as it was in the dam. The generator is made up of several components, the main ones being the rotor and the stator. The rotor is the part turned by the turbine and the stator is this series of windings. When the rotor rotates, a magnetic field is set up between it and the stator, creating electricity. The type of electricity created is called AC, alternating current. It is critical that this alternates at a constant rate. In New Zealand and most European countries, the rate is set at 50 cycles per second. Many electrical appliances rely on the rate of cycles to operate correctly and can be damaged by any fluctuation. Motors, for example, would run slower on a reduced number of cycles. If you used an electric clock designed for use in countries such as America, where the standard is set at 60 cycles, you'd end up getting to work half an hour early every day. Not a pretty thought. To ensure this doesn't happen to you, this governor controls the flow of water going through the wicket gates, enabling the turbines to be kept at a constant speed. This, in turn, keeps the cycles at exactly 50 per second. The voltage produced must also be kept constant. This is the job of the exciter. The electricity then flows through these bus bars, so-called because they're like a large electricity highway, to a series of transformers. Transformers contain two cores of wires and are used to increase or reduce electrical voltage. The generators at Benmore produce 16,000 volts. If such a comparatively low voltage was to be fed direct into the lines for distribution around the country, there would be severe transmission loss and the voltage arriving at its destination would be much reduced. To prevent this and move electricity most economically, the power is boosted through a transformer to 220,000 AC for distribution around the South Island via this AC switchyard. When it reaches the various substations throughout the island, it goes through other transformers, this time in the reverse direction, reducing the power to the 230 volts we have in our homes. Power for the North Island is treated in a completely different way. It comes from the generator in the same manner, but is then diverted to a building where it is converted from alternating current, AC, to direct current, DC. There are two converter stations at Benmore. The first uses mercury arc valves. The second came into commission in 1993 and uses banks of thyristors. This is real, state-of-the-art technology, and one would be forgiven for imagining it as some sort of futuristic space station. The high current involved in these areas means they are off-limits to anyone other than the technicians operating the equipment. It's possible to transmit direct current with far less loss than alternating current, an important factor when you consider the electricity has to travel nearly 600 kilometres, carried over 1,646 of these pylons, some as high as 1,200 metres above sea level. When the power reaches the top of the South Island at Fighting Bay, 
It then travels 35 kilometres under the sea across Crook Strait to Hayward substation. There it's converted back to AC to provide between 25 and 30% of the North Island's needs. All in all, a very complex and skilled procedure originating from the Benmore power station. Decisions are made by Central Control in Christchurch as to which power station will be operating at any given time to ensure the country has just the right amount of electricity available day and night and in the most cost-efficient manner. Complicated switching procedures are relayed to the heart of the Benmore power station, the control room, manned 24 hours a day, 365 days of the year. Lake storage levels are among the many factors that have to be taken into account to produce electricity at the desired levels. When lake levels become too high, perhaps due to flooding, water is released from the lake down this spillway. To prevent erosion, the water is deflected at the bottom of the spillway by this lip. The fanning out effect is quite spectacular. The spillway at Benmore can cope with ten times the normal river flow. This would cope with the worst flood expected in a thousand year period. Visitors to the area are encouraged to visit the information centre situated just below the dam. There are many interesting displays and tours of the dam can be arranged. But Benmore and the Waitaki Power Scheme are not just about the production of electricity. Hydro development has brought massive benefits to the area. It is now a sportsman's paradise. Water sports abound on the man-made lakes. Fishing, jet boating, rowing, skiing or just fooling around. Dotted on the lakeside are dozens of picnic and camping areas. Thousands of trees were planted during the construction of the dams and these now provide pleasant shading from the hot sun as well as many picture taking opportunities. The construction villages at Otamatata, Omarama and Twizel are now popular holiday resorts attracting thousands of visitors. Apart from water sports, the area is internationally recognised for its exciting gliding and skiing activities. The scheme is a practical working example of how it is possible to achieve a balance between producing power and protecting and improving the environment. Everyone wins. We hope you enjoy your stay.